And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. It's at Talking Boxing, T A L K I N B O X I N G. We'd appreciate it if you follow us and uh, get all your friends and friend, friends and friends and friends and their friends to follow us. And uh, if you're looking for a vitamin supplement company, comp- comp- only, but, but, comp- yeah, that's my, uh, I graduated from the Porky Pig uh, speech school, and uh, he taught me everything I know. But USANA is uh, where you want to get your vitamin, Vita Vita Vita, <laughs> just go to the webpage and click the banner, all right? It's time for Blast from the Past. We shine the spotlight again on fighters from years Rocky past. Marciano, top ranking. Joe Lewis is the leading contender. And up that's not a Mr. Combat be the Joe Frazier with a left hook. Good right hand thrown by Foreman that time. Look at that left that hook. Belt that goes to Ray Van It's Blast from the Past on Talking Boxing. Jeez, that was a little loud. This week's Blast from the Past, which is being uh, sponsored by uh, Knockout... Uh, <laughs> Uh, KO Fantasy Boxing, yeah, 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 KO Fantasy Boxing, check it out, www.kofantasyboxing.com, features a former uh, world champion and boxing hall of famer, Jeff Smith, and joining us right, right now to tell us all about Jeff Smith, my man, Alex Perpali, what's up, brother? Are you okay, man? You smell uh, burnt toast? I don't know. Okay? It was that. It was that. You know, we were just like the Hunger Games, minus the dead children. You know, I'm like, like Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy, what are you doing, man? But uh, uh, anyway, yeah, I don't know what's happened to me. Uh, it must be the cough drops, man. They must put something in it. But uh, uh, anyway, um, Jeff Smith. You know, after after I, I said we could do him, I, I did we do him before? No, we did not. Okay, all right. I know that there was somebody along these lines, but. Uh, got into the Hall of Fame uh, recently. Tell us about Jeff Smith. Yeah, Jeff Smith. When you um, when you sent it, the name over, I was like, "Who?" Um, but uh, yes, it just recently, 2013, he got into the Hall of Fame, and he certainly uh, deservingly so. Um, he, he's got, I, you know, this is not a very um, it's not going to be a very colorful blast because there's not a lot of good anecdotes that I that I found. But um, in terms of quality of opposition, boy, this is. Uh, as as you say, Billy C, this guy fought everybody. <laughs> he really did. I mean, look at all the names on his resume, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, but Jeff Smith, he was actually born Jerome Jeffords in New York, New York, um, way back on April twenty third, eighteen ninety one, and I uh, fought at middleweight. Um, he uh, fought a lot in Australia and actually did well. They called him the Globetrotter, the Bi- the Bayonne Globetrotter. Bayonne, uh, I think that's in New Jersey, right? Bayonne. Yeah, that's where uh, the the Bayonne Bleeder. That's that's where he's from. Yeah, well, you know so, the, the uh, original Rocky, huh? He must have been from that same area. And in terms of Levittown, New Jersey, um, yes, there's uh, I guess William Levitt. Who was from what I what I just read a little little bit about him? Um, he was a real estate developer uh, who's basically thought of as um, like the guy who created suburbia. Yeah. Um, you know, little uh, little boxes. That idea of uh, you know houses and neighborhoods that all look the same. And I guess um, Levittown. There's been several. Uh, there have were crea- several Levittowns were created. One was in New York. One was in Pennsylvania, one was in Willingboro Township, New Jersey, and one's in Puerto Rico. Huh. Well, I'm from Levittown, the one in New York, and and I, I believe John Levitt. I I, I didn't. I, William, you said William, but but it must have been his father because Levitt and Sons was the company. Yes, uh, so maybe it was one yes of those because guys. because uh, uh, John Levitt. I believe it was John. Uh, uh, I believe it was John. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Well, the the two, the two famous Levittowns were the New York and Pennsylvania. They were built after World War II. This Levittown was built substantially before that. Yeah, this. Um, yeah, it must have been because, uh, or maybe they just changed the name, and now that's what they're calling it. And maybe back then it was Bayonne. No, well, Bayonne, Bayonne is Chuck Wepner. That's who the, they call him, Bay, the Bayonne Bleeder. He, he, he was uh, 
uh, he was from, he's from Bayonne, New Jersey. Bayonne has been around a long time, but uh, well, anyway. maybe this maybe he's from that same area because they called him the Glo- Bayonne Globetrotter. Um, so maybe before it was Levittown, it was Willingboro Township or something. I don't know, but yeah, um, the most recent Levittown is the one in Puerto Rico that was created in '63. Yeah, wow, well, I didn't even know that. Hmm. Wikipedia, baby. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so William, uh, so Jeff Smith, and um, he uh, had a lot of fights locally in New- Newark, New Jersey, um, that area, New York. Um, he fought, one of the biggest names he fought early was uh, Jimmy Clavy, who was a guy we did in a um, blast from a past uh, a long time ago. Uh, I think it, that's probably a year ago now. Um, but he was um, a pretty, uh, uh, you know, He's a Hall of Famer and quite a tremendous fighter, and he earned, in 1911, his only his second year as a pro, he earned a uh, newspaper decision over him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that was one of those signs where he had arrived. He, he was kind of a, um, I didn't mention it, Bill, uh, he's more of a um, stylist, orthodox fighter, uh, more of a boxer, not a big puncher, consistent puncher, not a monster puncher jimmy clabby when he fought uh clabby in in early in his career like you mentioned i mean the, some of the other names that he fought and and not just once he fought many many times uh you know he fought the zulu kid uh, uh harry greb george chip uh several times mike gibbons who was, who's was another uh, uh good fighter uh he did fight les darcy who was a, 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 another world champion you know so he fought uh mike o'dowd mike mateague uh, before Matigue went into the light heavyweight division. So, I mean, this guy, uh, you know, and this was throughout his whole career. You know, you mentioned he fought Jimmy Clabby early, but he just continued. Leo Huck was another one. Uh, you know, I mean, all these guys he fought uh, all the way through his, I mean, he fought Tony Morello uh, late in his career, who was another uh, big name uh, during the time when he, when he came up. So, I mean, this guy wasn't ducking anybody, that's for sure. No, he, he didn't. And he, he didn't... Um he didn't draw the color line either. He uh, fought uh, black fighters as well. Um, he really was a guy who uh, fought all comers. Um, he fought Harry Greb, I think, it's six times. Um, and some of these, a couple of them, you know, Greb did not look too good, um, that he was less than, you know, less than himself. But, um, you know, he was always hanging in there. And that was the thing is that... Uh, even though in, against some of the guys, like you mentioned, he has wins over guys like Mike McTeague, who's a bigger guy, too. Even though uh, Smith was a middleweight, uh, he was beating bigger men. He fought um, Carpentier, and he fought, uh, who was the other big, big name, too, that was a, a large guy. McTeague was also, you know, fam- his famous days uh, were as a light heavyweight. Right. Um, so, you know, again, a, a large guy. Oh, and Gene Tunney as well. In uh, 1924, he fought the great Gene Tunney in New Orleans. Yeah, and that was towards the end of his career, <laughs> Gene yeah. Tunney, you know. So um, he, you mentioned that he was a, a, a slick boxer. He was known for his defense. He was, he was another one of these guys that was extremely hard to hit. But what I like about him uh, is that this guy's specialty – you know, which it doesn't seem synonymous when you say a defensive fighter, he's hard to hit, he's a slick fighter, but his strength was in fighting, something that, that exactly. is, you know, yeah. a, a, a extinct today. This guy preferred to fight in close. His favorite punch and his most effective punch was a left hook to the body. I mean, here's a guy that's the defensive master. He's considered a slick fighter, yet his strength and his biggest asset is the left hook because he likes to infight. How? Uh, that's a contradictory statement, don't you think? Yeah, I think that's the thing. That's one of the things that um, when I think any time you're looking at fighters, maybe before 1930. I mean, maybe you could even go before 25. Uh, infighting is a major, major part, and maybe it even goes longer. But when we're talking about is um, guys who are able to fight when they're in close or even partially clinched. Like, one arm is tied. Uh, you know, they, the fighters have one arm around each other, um, and then the other one's working. Uh, nowadays, a lot of referees don't even let that continue for more than a, a second or two. Um, that used to be much more part of the game. And, uh, yeah, a lot of these great guys who pe- they call clever boxers, uh, that's, like, such considered a, a rough 
and tumble aspect of the game today. But back then, most of the clever boxers were great infighters, and that's certainly the case with Jeff Smith. You know, it's interesting to, to, to try to follow the crowning of Jeff Smith because he did uh, have the world, um, the Australian version of the world middleweight title. As a matter of fact, I, I believe yesterday um, was the, uh, either yesterday or the day before was the uh, anniversary of, of when he won the title. Uh, it must have been uh, must have been on on Monday, uh, actually. Um, but uh, uh, you know, it doesn't show up in, in all the places. He he gets credited as being an uncrowned world middleweight champion, but he did hold the Australian uh, middleweight title. And and I and I'm thinking maybe I don't, I don't think he beat Les Darcy for it, who was also Australian. But I forget who he won. Do you, do you know what the deal was with that? That's actually that was one of the con- the big controversies of his career. And um, I read about it. Dan Cuoco has uh, a piece in uh, the Ibro. Um, you could get to it online, Ibro's uh, online section. He has a piece on Jeff Smith. And um, he mentions how um, reports of that about very greatly because you're right, there was uh, a loss on um, first, when they first fought, it was January 23rd, 1915. And uh, Smith had had a slight edge after four hard rounds with Darcy coming on strong. Jeff won by disqualification in the fifth when Darcy's handlers threw in the towel to protest what they claimed was a low blow. So then a couple of months later in May of that same year, they fought again. And in that one, um, they seemed to think that it, it sort of justified the fact that the first one should have been a fluke because in that fight, uh, Smith was DQ'd for low blows, um, so it was sort of interesting that both fights left a you know bad taste in the mouth of fans. Obviously, and you know, nobody likes when fights end like DQs with DQs, and um, that made it very difficult. As a matter of fact, I don't think he fought in Australia again for quite a few years, if ever. Let me double check that. I, yeah, I don't think he did. I think the fight, if I re- recall correctly. And I don't have it in front of me, but if I if my memory serves me right, I think he actually won the Australian middleweight title on April thirteenth in nineteen fourteen, which makes sense because I, I know I read it on one of my this days in history when he knocked out Pat Bradley in the sixteenth round of a scheduled twenty round fight. I believe he picked up the title then. When he fought Les Darcy and, and retained it with that uh, controversial disqualification in the fifth round, then I think he actually lost the title to Les Darcy with the return DQ when he got DQ'd in 1915. I think that was the the trail of the Australian version of the world middleweight title. If uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the way it happened. According to yeah, yeah, I think you're one. According to Cyber Boxing Zone, you're one fight off. April 13th was his first defense. They have Eddie McGordy as uh, a 20-round decision win, but you're right, that same year, 1914. So that the, the first Darcy fight, fight that was controversial, uh, where Darcy claimed being fouled, but uh, Smith won, that was in January of 1915, and then it was the rematch where he lost the title finally. So, yeah, that was the best that he got. But when you look at his, in terms of titles, but um, And this is one of those things where, you know, clearly the Hall of Fame voters realize this, too, that, you know, even though it says middleweight championship of the world, um, the bulk of his career after that, uh, I think, is probably what got him into the Hall of Fame because that's when he fights Greb, that's when he fights Lochran, that's when he fights Tunney and Gibbons. You know, so even Carpentier, though that was a Carpentier, title, uh, I mean, a championship, it wasn't you know, the bulk of his uh, he, he, credentials. He fought the Frenchman, too, Georges Carpentier, too. You know, he fought him. You know, and and uh, this, this guy, as far as the uh, the box rec that they go back and, you know, box rec does a good job of, of putting fights that they can actually trace back to either a newspaper uh, account or something. And they have uh, over 183 total fights. But in a lot of other uh, publications that you read about Jeff Smith, um, they claim that this guy had over 600 total fights in his career. 
I mean, you know, you could believe it con- considering how frequently he fought. And uh, they claim he put, uh, he traveled over half a million miles during his career, which spanned over 17 years. And back then, it wasn't like you were hopping on a plane. Yeah, so you're talking about um, boat, uh, big uh, trips on the uh, boats on the, on the high seas and trains, uh, on right? The, on the boats nowadays, um, you know, uh, I guess you could you got to be afraid of uh, drunk captains and uh, stomach viruses <laughs> and 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 uh, f- captains that are fondling women while they're having a few drinks too. Don't forget that. Don't add that in. You know, I mean, right, don't forget right. that. Run you know, the ship aground. Right, right. You know, but. Uh, uh, I you know six hundred fights, you know I mean that's uh, that's, that's a lot crazy, of fights, crazy. man. Six hundred, don't you think? Six, six, I'm sorry, I thought <laughs> I lost it. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I, mean, I was wondering what happened. I'm like uh, six hundred. Isn't that a lot to you, Papali? What do you think? What you 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 don't think this guy's fought frequently or what? Yeah. <laughs> no, that is, it is. It's amazing, and it really is one of those things where. Um, you just wonder how these guys did it because, um, according, I did find his obituary, and that's the only thing I where I saw like afterwards. He he lived to seventy years old, and it sounds like he had a uh, a career in a school system. He was a uh, gym teacher, um, so you know to think he, he was uh, re- he must have retired relatively intact. Uh, he lived all the way to nineteen sixty two. Yeah, um, you, you know it, it is something that we do to. To, to have a connection with that falls uh, right up your alley with with today and, and all the head injuries and the studies that they're doing. The guys that we read about that had some type of defensive skill, not all the time because we've heard about uh, recently we had the guy who used to put money down and try to make people hit him, but the, 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 he also had other vices, you know, alcohol and stuff like that, but that, that made him uh, not so successful in his retirement. But it seems like the guys that did possess defensive skill, did lead a more normal post-boxing life, you know, with other careers and, and you know, didn't end up in a mental, institu- mental institution or behind bars or living on the streets or something like that. I mean, there clearly seems to be a connection with a lot of these older fighters that we talk about during this segment, don't you think? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, what they would call uh, anecdotal evidence, at least, that... Um you're right that uh, the more uh, they they you know made it a priority to reduce the amount of uh, punches they you know absorbed with their face, um, they tend to last longer uh, and have a higher quality of life afterwards. Now, of course, there's other factors too because some of some of the same things we've seen, like you know, guys who were uh, face first brawlers were also heavy drinkers or something. They burn out even quicker, you know. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, it does seem that way. And, and he definitely was, that's not to say that he wasn't a tough guy too, because that's in this, uh, Cuoco piece, he has a quote from Harry, Gre- Harry Greb, who said, my toughest fight was with Jeff Smith. Gibbons gave me a hard bo- battle, but nothing like the Smith beating. He and I have had five arguments and he has always been a troublesome customer. To this day, I suppose he doesn't realize how near he came to flattening me. Wow. And that's from the late, great Harry Greb. You know, he had to be tough. Of his 12 losses, at least on on the record books, and then he had another 23, according to newspaper decisions, he was only stopped three times. And, and realistically, they were at the end of his career. He, he got stopped by the much bigger Tony Morello in 11 rounds in 1925. A year later, uh, against Murray Glidditz, uh, he was stopped in five, and his very last professional fight against the ever famous Cuban Bobby Brown, uh, he was stopped in in two rounds. And his last four fights of his career all took place in 1927. He lost uh, uh, three of them by decision, and that last fight I mentioned uh, by uh, a stoppage, and he hung him up. You know, uh, it's another thing that. Uh, seems to be more uh, of the case back in those days when a fighter would fight so long like he did for 17 years and then when it's over it's over they walk away and they move on to other things they don't make these uh uh multiple comebacks right right just um yeah get you're done and you walk away exactly yeah he um he definitely uh I, I, you know, 
I wonder if the long arms helped it because it sounds like he must have had long arms because he was only five eight and a half, um, but his reach was seventy one inches. So you got to figure. I mean, that's almost six feet. He's not six feet tall. Um, he's really not close to six feet tall. So maybe the long arms helped that um, defensive style. You know. Maybe that's why he kept dragging his hands along the ground when he walked. I don't know, man. But uh, uh, anyway, who did you put him up against? So I put him into uh, the title bout championship boxing game. Uh, I put him in against uh, the two top guys at middleweight, Miguel Cotto and uh, Gennady Golovkin. And um, first we'll do Golovkin. Uh, the first time they fought, I had um, – it, it, Jeff Smith actually won a lopsided decision, 117 to 113. He really slowed the fight down, made, uh, made Golovkin miss a lot. There were no knockdowns. He just really outboxed him. Uh, then I had them fight 100 times, and he got the better of Golovkin. Uh, 49 wins, 42 losses, 9 draws. He was able to stop him 15 times. And of Golovkin's 42 wins, he knocked Smith out 20 times. Wow, so now, Smith, uh, Smith, I was Smith. I talking it, with uh, is, is, Louie in the uh, chat room, and he was mentioning how this game does seem to have a, uh, uh, it's, it's Mayweather friendly, if you will. But wait, before, um, before you, I, before, there, Alex, wait, before, of, before you say that, did, are you saying that, that the game had Jeff Smith come out ahead of Triple G? Just slightly, yeah. 49 oh, wow. wins to 42. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you did. And then nine draws. What about Cotto? Uh, against Cotto, um, the, the first fight I had them fight, Smith actually wins by TKO in round five on cuts. Uh, but that was a bit of an aberration because they fought a hundred times, and Cotto actually got the better of Smith. Uh, 24, Smith ends up with a record of 24 wins, 65 defeats, 11 draws. He knocked Cotto out 12 times. Cotto knocked him out 25 times. Um, and see, now this is one of the things about, one of the things why, uh, in, in response to what Louis was talking about, the game does has a, there's a place where you could set it, um, whether a fighter is like in their prime, at what weight. Uh, so I went in and made sure, because if you think about it, uh, Floyd, at, um, I mean, uh, Cotto at middleweight is post-prime. So I put him in there post-prime, and even still, he did that well. And then I put him in, I said, well, you know what, let's see if I change it and make him a junior middleweight, but set the fight as a middleweight fight, so it seems like he's a blown-up middleweight. Well, he still dominated Jeff Smith, which I was surprised. Smith only wins 28. Cotto beats him 57 times. 15 draws, he was able to stop Cotto 13 times. So it does seem like it's skewed. I was surprised the uh, Golovkin thing broke like that because it certainly skews in favor of Floyd and Cotto. Cotto, uh, Floyd rather, did even better. Uh, A blown-up Floyd at middleweight uh, beats him 69 times. Jeff Smith only won 22 against Floyd. Well, Joe Cortez must have been the referee because it, we, we, all, we, all, we all hear that Jeff, Jeff Smith is an inside fighter and Cortez never lets anybody get inside on Floyd, so that had to be the referee for that fight, right? That's right, yeah. He was probably saying uh, he, did, he had to do uh, 100 fights and he was a busy, uh, busy ref. Yeah. Well, there uh, will be no clinching whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. That's, no that's, partial clinching. Yeah, none of this. <laughs> woo-woo-woo, none of this. Then definitely none of this, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Jeff Smith, 88 wins, 48 coming by knockout. He had 12 losses in which he was stopped only three times, uh, like I mentioned earlier. He had three draws. Now, that's on the uh, on the win-loss side. He also had newspaper decisions, according to the average newspapers. 53 wins, 23 losses, and a draw. According to BoxRec, 183 total fights. But uh, like uh, Alex and I were talking about earlier, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, publications that say this guy had as close as 600 professional fights that just were never uh, tracked down. Uh, he lived to 70 years old, passing away uh, a little after I was born. Uh, actually, five foot eight and a half, 71 inches, 1,634 rounds as a pro with a 27 percent knockout ratio. Uh, Jeff Smith, former world middleweight champion, boxing hall of famer, uh, as of uh, uh, 2013. 
He was our blast from the past this week. And uh, Alex, great job as usual on that one.